All right, welcome to Smokey Reacts. I'm your boy, Journalist. And on this one, I seen this video from a YouTube channel that I typically do watch. It's called 12 Tone. Shout out to 12 Tone. I've been watching these folks for years. However, I seen the easiest way to improve your lyrics was the title of this video. And for me, I am... Currently, I hang my hat on, I think I'm a very good songwriter. I do write songs for other people. I think I write really good songs for myself. But I'm always trying to grow as an artist and as a songwriter. And I think that is why the older I get, I'm able to actually continue to make really good music. Is because I always try and keep this space of, I'm never going to be perfect, but I can be better. And because I do that, I'm able to work with much artists much younger than myself and much older than myself. Because I don't fall into the trap of becoming rigid in my thought or what's allowable in the music. So I seen this and was like, well, maybe it can teach me something. And that was quite interesting for me. So I was like, cool, let me watch this and do a reaction to it, see what I get back from it, and then what I might be feeling I can add to the, to the conversation because I feel like I write a lot of songs and write for other people quite frequently. So we're going to watch it together. And then anybody else that writes songs or is interested in what I might have to say about the topic, might enjoy the video so that's what we're gonna do today that's the intro thank you guys very much for joining me if you could please hit that like subscribe patreon's in the description and let's get into this let's see what we get oh matter of fact on the on the topic of songs i got one it's out right now it's featuring manga saint hilaire it's in the description you can watch the lyric video at the end of the video but yeah that's it let's get into this and party bops like I Kissed a Girl, Teenage Dream, and Firework. K Katy Perry made her name on fun party bops like I Kissed a Girl, Teenage Dream, and Firework, but for her fourth album, Prism, she wanted to make something a little more serious. She wanted to have something to say, and after being invited by UNICEF to join a humanitarian trip to Madagascar, she was inspired to write a song that captured the warmth and beauty of the unconditional love that she witnessed there. Or at least, that was the goal. But if you remember anything about the song that followed, it's probably not the message. It's probably the fact that the chorus starts like this. Fans and critics alike were quick to point out that that's not how you pronounce that word. The awkward phrasing proved to be incredibly distracting for many listeners, and that linguistic backlash dominated the initial conversation, crowding out any real discussion of the song's intended meaning. So what went wrong? How Before we find out what went wrong, I would like to say, though, when it comes to writing lyric for, we'll say rap, or actually, yeah, we'll say rap specifically because this is where i see it used rap or r&b i would say the bastardization or the breaking down of the traditional or correct way to say things in english actually makes the lyric quite more interesting to the ear and causes the listener to fall more into it beside but in the pop space the proper usage of English, especially for Western pop, is almost like a mandatory need because you're going to a wider Western audience who typically speaks what they consider to be proper English. But in R&B and rap, those boys that speak pidgin in Africa, the, the patois, like those usages of how English gets broken is what makes those lyrics sing. So this is again where it's not the rule but it's a rule and like they say when you know the rule you can break it and knowing how and when to break it can be a very big tool in helping you increase how good your writing can be how did this happen and more importantly what can we as songwriters learn from it this video is sponsored by nebula check out the ad free extended version with the link in the description Unconditionally is a particularly striking example of what Dr. Aaron Smith calls prosodic dissonance. Prosody is the technical term for the patterns of stress and accents in speech, and prosodic dissonance is when those stress patterns don't seem to fit with the stress patterns of the underlying music. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but like with any form of dissonance, it's worth being aware of, and it's worth understanding so that if you do it, you're doing it on purpose. With that in mind, let's start by looking at how these stress patterns even work. In both speech and music, accents exist for roughly the same purpose. Contour. Having some parts feel more important than others gives the sound a sense of structure that makes it easier to parse. In music, this is how we create grooves, rhythms, and particularly impactful moments. In speech, it helps with processing and retention by breaking the constant flow of information into more manageable chunks. Accents are how we turn a series of individual phonemes into understandable words and phrases. Getting them right is 
kind of a big deal. Accents are also really important when language interacts with other mediums. As a straightforward example, check out how awkward it looks if I don't align the motion of my hand with the stressed syllables of my speech. Gross, right? Well, that's what's happening in your music. It's really obvious once someone points it out, but in my experience, a lot of new lyricists don't even consider it. They'll just make sure each line has the right number of syllables, and then wonder why it doesn't sound polished and professional. Honestly, if you stopped watching this video right now, there's a good chance that just hearing me say that was enough to improve your lyric writing, but, uh, don't do that. I'm already, that's why I watch this. And that's also why I watch this boy's channel is because there's detail work, especially because I feel that he speaks from more of a pop world, but not just a pop world. He does a lot of stuff on rock and roll. He's done stuff on jazz. He covers a lot of things. And the way he breaks it down sometimes, I'm like, the music world I've learned my techniques from first really are so rigid that a lot of these rules and stuff I didn't know until I started working outside of the genre I came up in. So this is why I really find it interesting because he contextualizes it in a way that I can understand it now that I do what I do. But it's like, ah, it's so helpful sometimes. It's so helpful. That, please? because I've still got a lot more to say. Like, how do we create that emphasis? It's probably not surprising to learn that speech and music use a lot of the same tools. They're both forms of communication, after all, and there's a lot of overlap in the systems we use to process them. I should note, by the way, that from here on out, when I talk about speech, I'm going to be talking about English. Different languages approach these tools differently, but English is the one I speak, so I'm going to use it as a case study. If you're writing in another language, the specifics may be different, but the underlying principles are probably still useful. You just have to think about about how your language works. With that in mind, our first tool is pitch. It's common for accented syllables to be noticeably higher, or if you really want to make a point, sometimes they go low. Either way, extreme pitches draw your attention. And of course, melodies also rely on pitch. In Boulevard of Broken Dreams, I walk a lonely road. the sudden, unprepared leap creates a dissonant accent on the second half of Lonely. Another shared aspect is volume. As I speak, there are slight fluctuations in the loudness of my voice, and those subtle differences are guiding your brain through this sentence. You're welcome. Melodies, on the other hand, don't tend to change dynamics quite as much from note to note, but for example, in White Room, Black roof country. the quieter delivery seems to remove an implied accent from the word roof. And finally, there's length. It's pretty natural to add a slight pause after a spoken accent, and musically, of course, melodies will often hold longer notes for accented syllables, resulting in this line from Shivers, Strawberries and something more that stretches out the end of strawberries. But music also has a couple more techniques that speech doesn't, and the most obvious one is meter. Melodies exist as part of a larger musical structure, and that structure has its own accent patterns defined by the underlying beat. Notes that line up with those patterns will feel more accented, like in Zanny, so where the location of the downbeat winds up emphasizing the wrong syllable in inebriated. And that example also highlights another key feature of melodic emphasis, repetition. In normal speech, there are no large-scale patterns. Each sentence has its own shape and its own set of accents based on what the words are and what it's trying to say. But melodies don't do that. Melodies do have patterns, with the same phrase structure repeating throughout a section and showing up in the same place when that section comes back. In Celebrity Skin, the third line of the first verse is this, and the third line of the second verse is this. Same basic melody, same accent pattern, so when we get to the third line of the third verse, you're coming in with an expectation that highlights the prosodic dissonance of the accented B when the line would probably be more naturally spoken, it better be worth it. And language has some of its own features as well, like vowel shape. Stressed syllables tend to have clearer vowel sounds. In fact, linguists even have a name for a specific kind of vowel that can only exist in unstressed syllables. It's called a schwa. It's a natural, relaxed sound that's easy to produce, and it can sound kind of like an uh, i, or e, eh, depending on the circumstance. Like, I've been saying the word syllable a lot in this video, but what vowel am I using for the second syllable of it? Is it syllable, syllable, or syllable? Honestly, it doesn't matter. It's a schwa. But as soon as I try to accent it, I have to make a decision, and whichever one I pick is probably going to sound at least a little wrong. And this can go the opposite way, too. Dr. Aaron points out the five seconds of summer song Easier, where the word damn is stripped of its accent by turning the vowel from a clear a eh into a schwa. You're so damn beautiful. 
All these factors affect how we hear accents and lyrics, but on their own, that's not really enough to create dissonance. Dissonance requires expectation. Something can only feel wrong if you have an intuitive sense of what's right. And that comes from language's most important feature, vocabulary. You know what these words are supposed to sound like because you've heard them before. That's why prosody is so important in traditional Western poetry. Poetic forms like iambic pentameter and ballad meter use repeated patterns of stress to build rhythms out of words. When you hear a line like, look on my works ye mighty and despair, there's a sort of swing to it that comes from the consistent way the accents fall across the sentence, with no musical support required. Of course, melodies do have musical support, so they don't have to be quite as strict about lyrical stress. You can add or remove syllables as needed, and rely on the meter to keep your phrases sounding consonant. But as we saw, that meter also adds another layer of interaction, which means more opportunities for misalignment. And if all that seems complicated, the good news is you probably don't have to worry about it, at least not directly. If you speak a language and you listen to music, you can probably already pick these up intuitively if you're paying attention. Like if I say the line, so don't think it's in the past, you don't need to break out a spectral analyzer to know that the strongest emphases were on don't, think, and past. So when Taylor Swift sings that line, so don't think it's in the past, and places these sharp accents on its and the, you can tell it's not quite right. And that's a great test for prosodic dissonance. Just speak the line on its own, then sing the melody without words, and see if they both point your ear in the same direction. If not, that line might need some attention. But what's the advice here? Should you just make sure you never write prosodically dissonant lyrics? Well... No. I mean, from a practical songwriting perspective, it's not the worst idea. Smooth lyrics are rarely a bad thing. It was hard finding examples for this video because experienced songwriters rarely do it, at least not in particularly obvious ways. But it's also not like any of the examples I used are bad songs. They're not even bad lyrics. So the point here isn't to avoid prosodic dissonance, it's to understand when and why you might want to use it. And the most obvious answer is convenience. Here, prosodic dissonance fills a similar role to, say, a slant rhyme, like in the rhyme scheme of encore. Can I get an encore? Do you want more? Cook your roll with the Brooklyn boys. So for one last time, I need y'all to brawl. Boy is absolute fucking juice. Is kind of a stretch. He shades it back with his pronunciation, but it's still a slightly different vowel, and it lacks a closing R. And yeah, we could say that's a mistake, and he should have used a better rhyme like lore, door, or shore. But like. Should he have? None of those say oh, the thing no. he's trying to say. Oh. Warping the line around to include them might have made it more technically precise in some abstract way, but it doesn't make it a better lyric. Great lyrics are about balancing sound and meaning, and choosing to use a slightly less perfect rhyme gives him access to a lot more expressive options. In the same, I'd say also for the the lesson, at least when I'm teaching people how to song right or like make music, this is where we've just been taught a rule of why things should work and shouldn't work. But that's where I always try and implore people when I'm telling them something, especially if you are a teacher or somebody, they lean very heavily on the thing you're telling them and making sure that you like stress to them that your art is your art and you need to have the bravery and choice and making sure that once you decide to break this rule that I've taught you, that you're breaking it, knowing that you're doing so and that you're doing it because you feel like it furthers your decisions in the art that you're trying to make because i don't like what happened to me when i was learning how to make music initially where i would make we'll say artful decisions because that's what i thought was right for the music i was trying to make and then people that were much older than me and more rigid in their thought would be like yo like that's not what we do over here and then that begins to put a box on the voice that you might have in the future and it took me a very long time and i'm still trying to fight against that now in the music that i make because i'm like ah like that's not cool that's not allowed like we're, we don't do that and it's like it's art and there actually there are no rules like we're learning all of this to like better strengthen our understanding of what we're doing but at the end of the day none of this shit is actually correct because it's all subjective. And you must always remember that for your art, you are making the decisions. And once you decide a decision for your art, that's what you have to believe in and put that forth. And that's something that I try and make sure people understand because it took me a really long time to understand that. And now when I teach people, I wanna make sure that people know that shit because I don't want anybody to get put into a box. It's not necessary. Boxes are kind of stupid. Same way, while it's technically true that war pigs poisoning their brainwash minds accents the wrong syllable of poisoning, does it actually bother you? If you've heard the song before, did you even notice that before I pointed it out? And now that I have 
do you care? That's the flip side of that repetition thing. Repeating the same melodic structure creates expectations, but it also provides cover. That clip from War Pigs may be slightly awkward on its own, but by the time it happens we've already heard Ozzy sing that same melodic figure three times. As the war machine keeps turning. And in each of those, his pronunciation was basically correct. Even with the slight stumble here, his delivery isn't so egregious that it overrides the pattern, so your brain just moves past it. Sorry about that. I'm out here organizing studio sessions, shows, Jesus Christ. albums, EPs. It's, it's about to get, it's getting busy on my side. And that's a pretty good rule of thumb. If you look at your favorite pop and rock songs, odds are the first couple lines of the first verse are straightforwardly consonant, but later verses may start to play a little fast and loose with their phrasing in order to get the words they want, and this is where that subtle dissonance can start to creep in. We saw a version of this in the encore example too. Jay-Z starts with a very strong rhyme of core and more, then gets a little looser with raw. Only after fully earning your trust in his rhyming abilities does he try to get away with boy. Of course, you can always push this too far. There's a reason he went with boy, which at least kind of fits, instead of, say, man, which obviously doesn't. Likewise, you can certainly write lyrics that are so prosodically dissonant that the power of repetition can't disguise them, but as long as you're paying attention to it, you'll probably catch those pretty easily. And if it's subtle enough to slip by you, it's unlikely to bother your audience either. But beyond convenience, there's an even more basic reason for these sorts of misalignments. They're kind of inevitable. The dependence on learned vocabulary means that prosodic dissonance is inherently subjective. Different accents and different dialects pronounce words differently, and that includes stress patterns. For example, I've always pronounced the word influence with the accent on the first syllable, so when I hear Pink sing, it sounds a little wrong to me. But I have friends who pronounce it influence with the accent on the second, so they'd hear the same line as perfectly correct. There's simply no way to use that word in your lyrics without creating some sort of dissonance for someone. And even within a single dialect, it's not always clear what the correct prosody is. Words and sentences can have different meanings depending on where you place the accent. Compare what are you doing with that elephant, 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 what are you doing with that elephant? Or what are you doing with that elephant? That's six different questions all containing the exact same words. If I wanted to set it to music, I'd have to know which one I was actually trying to say so I could line it up correctly. And that's not just a weird elephant-based hypothetical. We can see this shifting prosody in the opening line of How Do You Sleep? where John Lennon emphasizes you rather than took to make a much more pointed statement toward his old bandmate and current rival, Paul McCartney. But I don't want to give the impression that prosodic dissonance can only be used quietly and that any version obvious enough for a listener to notice must be a mistake. As with any other kind of dissonance, this can be a powerful effect. Sometimes it just adds a bit of spice, like in Sweet Emotion. <laughs> with the unusual pronunciation of police car gives it a jaunty little bounce. This is another reason you see these misalignments popping up more in later verses. The unexpected intonation helps keep the vocal phrasing from getting repetitive and boring. But it can also be used in more structural ways, ways that fundamentally change the emotion and narrative of the lyrics, and my favorite example of that is the clipping song Nothing Is Safe. The verses have this rough, jagged shape that consistently places unstressed syllables in accented positions. Everyone's safe and sound. This our family do. Only homies around. Everyone here is crew. To clue us into the fact that will the lyrics describe? I'm trying to what's the call? That it's gonna be out here in February. I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get the support slot for that. Describe an almost obsessive level of security. The threat these characters face is far more powerful, and that illusion of safety is about to be shattered. The prosodic dissonance creates this uncomfortable, anxious sort of tension as we watch them go about their business, blissfully unaware of what's coming for them. So, what about unconditionally, the Katy Perry song we heard at the beginning? It's 
Kind of a perfect storm. For starters, it's just a long word. Most of the flexibility we have to move accents around comes from moving them between words, not moving them around inside of one. There are some words whose meanings change with different accents, like record and record, but those are rare and unconditionally isn't one of them. Using it means locking in a stress pattern for six consecutive syllables, which makes it hard to fit with a generic melody. It's also not a repetition. Instead of burying this at the end of a verse, it's how she starts the chorus, placing it front and center in a huge climactic moment that practically invites you to listen closely and notice any flaws. And the accent happens in multiple ways simultaneously. That seemingly incorrect syllable is on the downbeat, the stressed syllable before it is rhythmically shortened to remove its accent, there's a big leap up in pitch that's accompanied by an increase in vocal power. Honestly, it'd be hard to make this sound more clearly wrong, even if that was your explicit goal. Which raises an interesting question. Was it their goal? I mean, Perry was a pretty experienced songwriter by that point, and she was working with other seasoned pros, including the king of modern pop, Max Martin. And it's not even the only obvious example in the song. She does it again here, the dirty laundry. and here. Will you do the same for me? So was it a successful use of prosodic dissonance for emotional effect, or a surprisingly amateur mistake that they probably should have caught and avoided? I don't know. It depends how we define success. Like, did I would say it was, at least from the songwriting rooms I've been in, when you're doing this type of technique or these type of things, and they're famous, famous, the cachet of I'm fucking the person that people are going to listen to, people get away with murder. People get away with fucking murder. And I promise you, if Max Martin was on the song, Katy Perry's writing the thing, and let's say there's two or three other people that are like the really good seasoned pros, like, you know who we are? We do what the fuck we want. And that's where making your art how you would like to make your art comes in. And that's, I believe, where they hung their hats because they know we got a major lab label budget behind this. The elitist of pop, they might not like this because they'll see what we're doing. But the casuals or like the stands of Katy Perry, they hear that shit. They're like, this is a beautiful song. Did it accurately convey Perry's intended message to the majority of her listeners? Probably not. The way she talks about the song in interviews doesn't imply that this is the reception she wanted. But maybe that doesn't matter. This is the reception it got, and that also reveals something meaningful about the thing the song was trying to say. As Dr. Aaron writes, Whether or not Katy Perry and her songwriting team intended it, I chose to both laugh uncomfortably at her rendition of the title word, then to interpret my own discomfort exactly in line with the intended message of the song, regardless of apparent flaws, embarrassing missteps, or music-theoretical naivety. The narrator proclaims acceptance and love of the whole listener. The song expects the discomfort of our angry tweets and well-meaning pedagogy and dares us to enjoy it unconditionally, whether we ultimately choose to or not. And I think that's an important thing to remember. Music theory isn't about deciding what's good or bad. It's about identifying tools and understanding their impact. Prosodic dissonance is one such tool, and while well, avoiding it will almost always be a safe choice, it won't always be the right one. This is a topic I've been thinking about for a long time. Like, since before I started making 12 Tone, I remember having conversations about it with my friends back in college. It's such an important part of understanding lyrics, but it's also super easy to overlook, so it was really cool to finally find some actual scholarship on it. Honestly, Dr. Aaron's whole paper is so interesting, but there were a lot of parts that just didn't really make sense to get into here, so if you want to hear about those, along with a bunch more of my thoughts, you should really check out the Nebula Cut. For each video I make, I also record an extra unscripted section of things that wouldn't fit in a streamlined script of a YouTube video, and having that space has let me dive even deeper into all sorts of interesting but more obscure areas, like the cultural implications of prosodic dissonance, techniques for using it in more advanced ways, and even some thoughts on how it applies to my own work. If that sounds like fun, you can use the link in the description to get 40% off an annual membership on Nebula. And Nebula is great for this sort of thing. It's a huge community of really talented creators making whatever they want to make. And if you're looking for somewhere to start, there's a really exciting new series called The Wonder of It All, where Sean Nelson, the lead singer of the band Harvey Danger interviews other... I don't know, calling them one-hit wonders sounds rude, but artists whose careers were defined largely by a single breakout moment. The first episode is a conversation with Adam Duritz from my dad's favorite band, Counting Crows. And of course, there's a lot of great video essays and music education stuff on Nebula as well, including good friends of mine like Polyphonic, Adam Neely, and Amy Nolte, whose voice you heard. If you don't know about Polyphonic or Adam Neely... I don't know about the, the third name he said, but Adam and Polyphonic have amazing channels as well. Like, 
less so much earlier in this video. And again, 40% off with the link in the description, which comes out to just 30 bucks a year. And hey, thanks for watching. Thanks to our featured patrons, Susan Jones, Jill Sungard, Howard Levine, Warren Hewitt, Damian Fuller. All right. Um, I think I wish I had the longer version of this video because the cultural implications of how prosodic dissonance actually works in a song, I really do feel it comes um, more forefront in, we'll say, non rhotic speaking accents and then also in languages that people... They speak another language before English is their first language is the best way for me to say it because that's where I find it to pop up the most. But it makes the lyric sing so much. Or maybe I'm just a person that finds a love or an enjoyment of noticing the prosodic dif dissonance in a song. And that's where I'll listen to a lot of people and I'll be like, how the fuck they do that? And then it's because they're, they're like, they're, English is not their first language. So then it creates this thing naturally in them. Because, again, how you learn a word and you learn language first, if it's not English, you'll use words in ways that, like, English speakers would never fathom to use them. And that's, I feel like it causes that to happen a lot more. But that's just me. Overall, uh, I feel like I knew, I'll say, like, 65% of this already. But I wanted to watch it because even if I didn't know everything at first, oh, Jesus Christ, I'll talk to you after, man. I don't have time for this. Uh, even if I already knew most of it, it's really good to kind of just see somebody else kind of talking about something that you're already kind of into, and then that turns into other th ways for you to be able to kind of enjoy and understand the tools that we all work with. Because the better I understand the tools I use to craft songs, I can better make songs or help people in the future. And for me, I think I'm like a really good rapper, but I would love to be a prolific songwriter because being a good rapper is only one tool in my tool belt especially the more I do this and the more songs I get to work on like if I didn't care about songwriting and the musicality of how music works I don't think I'd be as good in the jazz realm that I'm currently working in and that has led me to now learn other tools and techniques that help me in other places and knowing the tools of how songs are written is probably the thing I thirst for the most especially now that I'm kind of out of that space of oh, I need to be the world's best rapper. And it's like, I don't care about that anymore. I want to be like the world's best songwriter. And I want to be able to write a song any room I step into. I go into an opera room. How, what are the tools these people use? How are the themes managed and, and like constructed? Like these are the things that like I stay up lit, like thinking and listening to stuff about. So this is why I really wanted to watch this. Uh, anybody that does watch this and got to the end, thank you very much. I truly do appreciate it. I hope this helped you or it was an interesting video for you and i'll see you guys on the next one i'm out of here peace